Well, hello and welcome to today's Third Thursday webinar. I am Tom Sandry, Technical Service Director here at ProTech Equipment Resources. All right, today we're going to continue with our medium voltage cable testing and diagnostic series, part two of our three part series. But before we get started, let's go ahead and review some of the items that we covered in part one. We talked about cable deterioration can occur through various mechanisms. Dry electrical defects, thermal deterioration, water ingress. We talked about aggressive environment, contaminants, and chemical attack. And also how neutral corrosion leads to cable deterioration. We had also talked about that test methods can be divided into two categories, depending upon the objective or the intent of the test. We discussed what's known as type one, go or no go, pass or fail type testing. Now included in type one testing, it could be as simple as a, uh, insulation resistance spot reading, a high potential test, whether we use direct current, 50, 60 hertz power frequency, or very low frequency, VLF. We had also talked about type 2 testing, which is diagnostic in nature. Tests of this type would include time-resistant insulation tests, such as polarization index and dielectric absorption, tangent delta, or simply tan delta testing, and partial discharge would also fall under the category of type 2 and diagnostic testing. Monitored withstand, where we monitor the tan delta or the partial discharge activity during the withstand test. In part one, we also discussed the EPRI report TR101245 and this report concluded that DC high potential testing of field aged extruded dielectric cables reduces the life of the cable. DC high potential testing of field aged extruded dielectric cable will generally increase water tree growth. And the EPRI study concluded that DC high potential testing before energizing new medium voltage cable does not cause any reduction in cable life. Now, current industry cable testing guidelines do not recommend the use of DC high potential testing after a cable has reached service life, five years in service. And, oh, by the way, Joe, you're looking very stern relax a little bit, man. Have some fun. Oh, hey, sorry. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. No, you're doing a great job, Joe. Keep up the good work. So, topics that we are going to be discussing in part two will include high potential testing using power frequency, 50 or 60 hertz. We will take a look at high potential testing using very low frequency or VLF methods. We will take a deep dive into tan delta testing using the VLF. We will talk about evaluating tan delta results and also the use of monitored withstand testing at VLF or very low frequencies. Now, AC voltage testing at power frequencies of 50 to 60 hertz is conducted by manufacturers and it stresses the insulation in a very similar manner to basic field operation. The withstand testing determines the dielectric strength of the insulating system and locates gross defects. The test looks at the bulk of the insulation and renders a simple pass-fail conclusion. As a field test, however, power frequency testing suffers a serious disadvantage. 
at increased voltage levels, the test set requires very heavy, bulky, and expensive transformers in order to produce the necessary bolt amps or VA required to energize the cable. Now, the reason for the large transformers when referring to cable testing has to do with the capacitance of the load being tested. Capacitive reactance, or X sub C, changes as a function of frequency, as seen in the formula. Capacitive reactance equals 1 divided by 2 pi FC, where F is the frequency of the test voltage, and C is the capacitance under test, or the capacitance of the cable. Therefore, if we're testing a 15 kV rated cable of approximately 10,000 feet in length, the capacitance would be around 1 microfarad. Based on the formula, the capacitive reactance at 60 Hz will calculate out to be 2,654 ohms, as we see here. Now, in order to apply the IEEE recommended 22,000 volts of test voltage, it would require a power supply rated for 8.3 amps or 183 kVA. As we see in the formula, 22,000 volts divided by 2,654 ohms would be 8.3 amps. Multiplying the 22,000 uh, volts by our 8.3 amps, we would get our 183 kVA requirement. Now, the physical size and weight of a transformer capable of this rating may not be practical as a portable field unit. The size of the necessary equipment can be substantially reduced by using the principles of resonance. In the ideal case of a perfect resonance, the test source will only be required to supply energy to balance the true resistive loss in the inductor and cable system. Even with the application of resonance, however, these power frequency high voltage supplies can be quite large and heavy, requiring dedicated test vehicles to transport to and from the job sites. Power frequency high potential testing is considered a type 1 go no go test, but it can be used with auxiliary equipment for the purposes of type 2 diagnostic testing. Now, like power frequency test methods, if used alone, very low frequency or VLF testing is considered a type 1 go no go test but it can also be used with auxiliary equipment for the purposes of type 2 diagnostic testing. Auxiliary equipment can be partial discharge uh, detecting equipment and or dissipation or tan delta couplers uh, and measurement equipment. So, why is VLF or very low frequency test sets smaller than power frequency test sets. Well, again, we have to go back to capacitive reactance equals 1 divided by 2 pi Fc, where once again, F is the frequency of the test voltage and C is the capacitance of the cable under test. So, if we are testing a 15 kV rated cable of approximately 10,000 feet, the capacitance would be around 1 microfarad. Based on the formula, the capacitive reactance at 0.1 Hz test frequency would calculate out to be 1.6 megohms, as we see here. Now, the same 22,000 volts would now only draw 14 milliamps, or 303 VA. Therefore, the size, weight, and portability of the power supply it becomes very convenient for field use. And here we see our calculations. Now, VLF power supplies 
can be constructed as either a cosine pulse or rectangular waveform, or they can be constructed as a sinusoidal waveform output. Let's first look at that cosine pulse or the rectangular waveform VLF. The cosine pulse waveform version is constructed using a DC test set that acts as the high voltage source. A DC to AC converter then changes the DC voltage to the VLF AC test signal. The converter consists of a high voltage inductor or choke and a rotating uh, rectifier that changes the polarity of the cable system being tested every five seconds. This generates the 0.1 Hertz bipolar wave as we see here in the graphic. A resonance circuit consisting of a high voltage inductor and a capacitor in parallel with the cable capacitance assures sinusoidal polarity changes in the power frequency range. The use of a resonance circuit to change cable voltage polarity preserves the energy stored in the cable system. Only leakage losses have to be supplied to the cable system during the negative half of the cycle. The intent of the VLF cosine pulse waveform test is to generate a 0.1 Hertz bipolar pulse wave that changes polarity sinusoidally. If a defect exists, Sinusoidal transitions in the power frequency range will then initiate a partial discharge at the insulation defect, which the 0.1 Hertz pulse wave develops into a breakdown channel. During the test period, typically within minutes, a defect can be detected and forced to break through under these controlled conditions. After the defect breaks, and faults, it can then be located with standard readily available cable fault locating equipment. When the cable system passes the VLF test, it can then be returned into service. Now let's look at the sinusoidal waveform version of the VLF test set. The VLF test uh, set generates sinusoidally changing waves that are less than 1 hertz, typically 0.1 hertz, 0.05 hertz, and 0.02 hertz. When the local field strength at the cable defect exceeds the dielectric strength of the insulation, partial discharge will occur. The local field strength is a function of the applied voltage, defect geometry, and space charge. After initiation of partial discharge, the partial discharge channels develop into breakthrough channels within the applied test period. When a defect is forced to break through, it can then be located once again utilizing standard fault locating equipment during a scheduled outage. Now let's take a look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of the cosine pulse waveform. Among the advantages, the sinusoidal transitions are in the power frequency range and can initiate a partial discharge at an insulation defect. The 0.1 Hertz pulse wave can then develop the defect into a breakthrough channel, faulting the defect during the scheduled outage. Also an advantage, due to continuous polarity changes, space charges cannot develop and therefore no new defects will be initiated during the test process. Another advantage, the cables can be tested with an AC voltage up to three times the normal phase to ground voltage with a device comparable in size, weight, and power requirements to a typical DC high pot test set. 
Now, among the disadvantages of the cosine pulse wave, when testing cables with extensive water tree damage or ionization of the insulation, VLF testing alone is often not conclusive. Another disadvantage of the uh, cosine pulse, due to the layout of cosine rectangular test voltage generation, the waveform is dependent on the cable length being tested. A DC offset or bias may be possible. Now let's review the advantages and disadvantages of the sinusoidal VLF waveform. Among the advantages, cables are tested with an AC voltage up to three times the normal phase to ground voltage. After initiation of a partial discharge, a breakthrough channel at a cable defect develops very rapidly and can be located during a scheduled outage. Another advantage, due to continuous polarity changes, space charges cannot develop and therefore no new defects will be initiated during the testing process. Also among the advantages, cables can be tested with an AC voltage up to three times the normal phase to ground voltage, utilizing a device comparable in size, weight, and power requirements to that of a standard DC test set. Another advantage, Due to the sinusoidal regulated waveform and to the highest electrical tree growth rate as compared to the cosine rectangular waveform, electrical trees will be initiated at a defect within minutes. And also among the advantages, the test voltage level and waveform is defined as RMS voltage and is completely independent of the cable length. The disadvantages of the sinusoidal VLF waveform. When testing cables with excessive water tree damage or ionization of the insulation, VLF testing alone is often not conclusive and the total charging energy of the cable has to be supplied and dissipated by the test in every electrical period. This limits the size of the cable system that can be tested. Now, what exactly happens during a VLF AC withstand test? Well, it depends on the condition of the cable's insulation. VLF high potential testing is not destructive to good insulation and does not lead to premature failures like we learned about in direct current or DC high voltage testing that we discussed in part one of this cable testing series. Now using VLF does not cause degradation of good insulation nor aggravate defects too small to be triggered into partial discharge under the test voltage. It does cause existing cable defects that are severe enough to be triggered into partial discharge under the test voltage to break through or fail in a controlled environment during the test. Minor defects that are not triggered into partial discharge from the test voltage are unaffected. Now, how long should a test be run? Well, according to IEEE 400.2, standard for acceptance testing uh, cables ranging from 5 kV to 35 kV, cables which are tested between two times uh, U-naught um, and three times U-naught phase to ground, 68% of failures occurred within 12 minutes of testing, 89% within 30 minutes, and 95% after 45 minutes, and 100% after one hour of applied test voltage. These results were found using both types of power supply waveforms, 
the sinusoidal, and the cosine rectangular, with the most uh, used being the sinusoidal waveform type. And here in the illustration, we show the channels growing during the test voltage. As we see, it takes time in some situations to grow the defect to point of failure. Now, suggested maintenance testing is generally 15 minutes in length, slightly above or below the phase-to-phase -phase voltage using the sinusoidal waveform. The reason for this is that the test is performed at 0.707 RMS of the peak value. While testing using the cosine rectangular waveform, the test is performed at a slightly higher voltage assuming the RMS is equal to the peak value. Due to its withstand character, the VLF test cannot generate any fault on its own. For a fault to happen, the cable system must have a defect in the insulation or accessories. The test does not grow anything that is not there. If there is no PD to trigger, it will not cause partial discharge. Do not compromise on testing time, however. Very low frequency voltage grows electrical trees over time. VLF voltage initiates electrical trees and causes a breakdown over time. VLF voltage accelerates failures of critical defects over time. VLF voltage needs time to do all of this. Users must not stop early and partially grow a defect channel and then place the cable back in service. This creates a very high risk of failures at an increased rate after testing had been concluded. So, what if we don't want to or wish to grow a defect? Well, perhaps you only wish to know the general health or aging characteristics of your cable. The TAN Delta test can be performed and will serve as a type 2 diagnostic test providing information related to the health or aging of your cable or cable system. TAN Delta, also called loss angle or dissipation factor testing, is a diagnostic method of testing cables to determine the quality of the cable insulation. This is done to try to predict the remaining life expectancy and in order to prioritize cable replacement and or silicon injection efforts. It is also useful for determining what other tests may be worthwhile, such as the VLF withstand or partial discharge testing. Now, if the insulation of a cable is free from defects, like water trees, electrical trees, moisture, and air pockets, etc., the cable approaches the properties of a perfect capacitor. It is very similar to a parallel plate capacitor, with the conductor and the neutral being the two plates separated by the insulation material. 
in a perfect capacitor, the voltage and current are phase shifted 90 degrees and the current through the insulation is capacitive current. In a real cable, however, there are dielectric losses in the insulation. And if there are impurities in the insulation, like those mentioned, the resistance of the insulation decreases, resulting in an increase in resistive current through the insulation. It is no longer a perfect capacitor. The current and voltage will no longer be a shifted by 90 degrees. The shift will be something less than 90 degrees. The extent to which the phase shift is less than 90 degrees is indicative of the level of dielectric losses and insulation contamination, hence quality reliability. The loss angle is measured and analyzed. The tangent of the angle delta is measured. This will indicate the level of resistance in the insulation. By measuring the resistive current divided by the capacitive current, we can determine the quality of the cable insulation. In a perfect cable, the angle would be nearly zero. An increasing angle generally indicates an increase in the resistive current through the insulation, meaning contamination and higher dielectric losses. Keep in mind, however, that different insulating materials have higher or lower dielectric losses. Therefore, the angle or tan delta value may be higher for some insulating materials due to their dielectric losses. We need to keep in mind that the goal of tan delta testing is to provide a quality reliability indication of an insulating system. In a cabling system, the terminations and splices are part of that system. If the insulation of the system and all accessories are free from defects like water trees, electrical trees, moisture, air pockets, etc. The cabling system approaches the properties of a perfect capacitor as we had stated earlier. It should also be noted that in the event the cable circuit has transitions between multiple insulation types, for example, a cross-link polyethylene cable transitions into an ethylene propylene rubber or EPR. The tan delta value will be influenced by the component with the higher dielectric losses. Now, in this example, ethylene propylene rubber or EPR has much higher dielectric losses than the cross-link polyethylene portion of the circuit and the tan delta uh, results will be uh, influenced by the EPR component. This obviously hampers the effectiveness of the test since contamination growing in the crosslink polyethylene portion of the cabling system may be masked by the higher dielectric losses of the ethylene propylene rubber. So, how do we perform the tan delta test? Well, when performing maintenance testing, IEEE standard 400.2-2013, guide for field testing of shielded power cable systems using very low frequency VLF, less than one hertz, states that we perform the test in three steps starting at one half of the operating voltage of the circuit phase to ground. This is expressed as 0.5 times U0. We then elevate the test voltage to operating voltage or U0 and then to one and a half times the operating voltage or one and a half times U0. At each voltage level, we obtain 5 to 10 tan delta readings. At 0.1 hertz, that would be one reading every 10 seconds. 
Now, there are three basic criteria for evaluation of the test data. The TAN Delta or TD reading. In addition, the 5 to 10 TAN Delta readings obtained at the test voltage can be used to calculate the mean of the readings, the mean TAN Delta or the average TAN Delta. And that would be calculated in the equation that we see here. Now, the stability of the tan delta reading obtained at each test voltage is also looked at. The tangent delta stability refers to the variation of tan delta with time at a constant voltage level. The tan delta stability is defined as the measurement of the standard deviation of tan delta with time at a particular voltage or u naught, And standard deviation is calculated as we see here. We also look at the differential tan delta. The differential tan delta is taken by subtracting the average or mean tan delta reading obtained at the 1.5 u naught test voltage by the mean tan delta reading taken at the 0.5 u naught test voltage. As we see in this equation. Now, Mean tan delta, differential tan delta, and standard deviation are diagnostic methods of testing medium voltage cables to determine the quality of the cable insulation and the aging characteristics. This is done to try to predict the overall reliability of the cable and the remaining life expectancy. The test must be performed using a VLF instrument capable of producing a sinusoidal wave shape. Do not perform tan delta measurements with a cosine rectangular, a DC step, or bipolar rectangular wave shape. Now, when evaluating your test data, we need to first identify the type of insulation that we are testing. Different types of insulation will have different inherent dielectric losses as we discussed earlier. For this reason, we need to identify the type of insulation and expected normal losses. The IEEE 400.2 2013 Guide for Field Testing of Shielded Power Cable Systems using VLF provides tables showing historical figures of merit for condition assessment of service-aged insulation. If all criteria for evaluation are within the expected parameters, no action is required. IEEE recommended repetition rate of testing for a healthy cable is every five years. If the cable is outside of any of the expected criteria for evaluation parameters, further study is advised and the repetition rate of testing is then reduced to annual testing. If any of the evaluation criteria is well outside of the expected parameters, action is required, and cable replacement should be a consideration. Now that we have a better understanding of TAN Delta testing and the diagnostic value that it offers, let's look at how TAN Delta could improve the VLF high potential or the withstand test. A monitored withstand is performed by monitoring the tan delta or possibly partial discharge values during the duration of the withstand test period. If partial discharge 
and discharge channel growth activity is initiated during the test, the growth can be monitored so that the cable is not placed back into service in a weakened state. So let's take a look at some test results where we performed a monitored withstand test. Here we see that the test voltage was at one half U naught or 0.4, excuse me, or 4.4 kV. We see that the standard deviation was 0 0.01 to the exponent of negative 3, which was well within the stability requirements in the tables of merit provided by the IEEE document. Now, at a voltage level of 8.7 kV, 1 times U0 phase to ground, we now see that the standard deviation has gone up to 0 0.08, still well within the parameters specified in the tables of merit provided in the IEEE document. When we reached a voltage of 13 kV, which was one and a half times U naught, we now see that the standard deviation has grown to 0.35. And finally, when we get to our withstand voltage, we now see at 16 kV, the standard deviation has jumped well to 2.18, well outside of the parameters of the tables of merit. We also see that the 10 delta values during the time period start to increase even though the voltage is fixed at the 16 kV withstand test voltage level we are now clearly beginning to witness the growth of a defect channel. Now the benefit of the withstand test is as we see the deviation grow or we begin to see the tan delta grow, we can either immediately stop the test before changing the as found characteristics of the cable or we grow the channel during the duration of the test into a defect where we can now locate and render the necessary repairs. So let's review. The main advantage of testing at very low frequency is that it significantly reduces the size, the weight, and the cost of the required power supply and thus offers greater attraction for field testing of medium voltage cables. Also, VLF high potential testing is not destructive to good insulation and does not lead to premature failures like those created with high voltage DC testing as we learned in part one of this cable testing series. VLF tests cannot generate any fault on its own. For a fault to happen, the cable system must have a defect in the insulation or in the accessories. Also, according to the IEEE 400.2 standard for acceptance testing, of cables ranging from 5 kV up to 35 kV, cables which are tested between 2 times U0 and 3 times U0 phase to ground, 68% of the failures occur within 12 minutes of testing, 89% within 30 minutes of testing, 95% after 45 minutes, and 100% after one hour of testing.
tan delta, which is also referred to as loss angle or dissipation factor testing, is a diagnostic uh, method of testing cables to determine the quality of the cable insulation. Tan delta or means tan delta, differential tan delta, and standard deviation are diagnostic methods of testing medium voltage cables to determine the quality of the cable insulation and the aging characteristics of the cabling. A monitored withstand test is performed by monitoring either the tan delta or partial discharge activity values during the duration of the withstand test. This provides the benefit of not being subjected to merely a pre-described time period for testing. But if a channel defect begins to grow, we can either stop the testing immediately, allowing the cable to be put back into service in as close to an as-found condition, or we now can continue to grow the channel independent of time until the channel breaks through and now we can locate the fault and render necessary repairs. Again, the main advantage of the monitor test is we are no longer at the mercy simply of a stopwatch or a prescribed time period. We actually have the ability to view and witness defects growing in the cable system. If a partial discharge and tree growth activity is initiated during the test, the monitor test, the growth can be monitored so that the cable simply is not placed back into service in a weakened condition. And that concludes part two of our three-part webinar series. We're going to go ahead and keep the lines open now for questions and answers, and we will definitely try to get to all of the questions and answers that we can during the remaining time of our webinar. However, if we do not get to your question, if you type it into the chat, we have it documented, and we will definitely get back to you with your answer. Once again, Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy days and attending our third Thursday webinars. We look forward to seeing you at many more of the webinars in the future, and we hope that you find value in these webinars. So without further ado, let's get to those questions and answers.